Thank God. Well, the rain didn't bother some of you. Praise God and the Lamb. To you, I salute and say God bless you. Amen. And I'm glad you're here. We're going to have church this morning. Amen. Yeah. I'll give you a quick update. Uh, I guess Tim probably ought to told you how great the marriage retreat went. If he didn't, it was phenomenal. We had just one of those great, great marriage retreats. Just, uh, I, I hate to go into it because you that missed it just feel worse. <laughs> but everybody who went, was it good? Yeah. That's what I thought. <laughs> it was a great time. Last Sunday I was out because I was down in Belize, Central America. We were involved in the first national convention they've ever done. I felt like uh, that uh, we were invited to come and participate in that and felt like we needed to do that. Usually don't go down to Belize that, that time of the year. The team that's in the bottom picture there that went with me, uh, the, the pastor on the right side is uh, a pastor from Lafayette, Louisiana by the name Ferdinand Gaines. He uh, has uh, done some stuff in Belize. I've invited him to come with us before. He does a great job. I had him there to help with the, the conference. It was a weekend deal that came. It, it was a men's, uh, ministry retreat. It was a women's ministry retreat. It was a youth retreat. And then Sunday capped off the big national conference for the churches all coming together. Some of y'all know Pastor Darby on the other side of that picture there. He and his wife, Jocelyn, she helped with the women's ministry as well. And uh, they went along and participated. James spoke to the young people uh, while Pastor Gaines and I did the men's conference. Uh, it was just a great, great time of the Lord. Of course, I took Kathy. I just hate to leave her behind, you know. And yes, I paid her way, not the church, so chill out, okay. But uh, we had a great time, Lord, and Kathy always does a great job ministering to those pastors' wives. The National Convention, they were a little, uh, you know, they've had some conferences where they've kind of brought together four leaders from each region, but they've never done an open conference where on a Sunday they said, we're just going to ask everybody from every church that can come to come be a part of it. Uh, you can see it was very well attended, blew their minds, it blew my mind, it was well beyond what I expected. And the reason, because this is a, this is a third world country, not everybody has cars, all right? Few people have cars, even some of the regional leaders don't have cars. To come to this conference. I, I spoke with, y'all remember last year, those who went to Belize uh, with me, we did Punta Gorda, the big area crusade. The regional director from Punta Gorda doesn't have a car. He hitchhiked there. And if, if you know Belize at all, Punta Gorda is the last village in Belize in the southern end. This took place up at the northern end of the country. So he starts out a day or two early just hitchhiking to get there. And this was the way it was with a lot of these people. They came, they, 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 they Sacrifice. Some rode village buses, which are, none of those are air conditioned. Most of them are just held together, baling wire and mask and duct tape, you know. Uh, so these people came from a long way to be a part of what, what God was doing there in that day. And it was a phenomenal event. Uh, for that group of churches to start with, just to be there, to be excited, to see what they were doing. It was especially a blessing to me to be a part of that. We've ministered in a lot of these churches. Uh, they participated. We've ministered to all their pastors. We've had a part, our church, you have had a part in uh, ministering, developing, maturing, being an influence in all these churches. And I believe part of this conference was a result of our ministries down there with these pastors. Just their vision has continued to be stirred. Their vision continues to grow and increase to reach their whole nation. So it's exciting to see what God is doing there. And you're a big part of that, whether you realize that or not. You, you, you play an important part of what God's doing there. And to uh, be able to go down there and participate on this level is, is always a tremendous blessing. I was especially touched by one pastor I hadn't seen in a couple of years because he's old. He's out of the ministry and uh, he's probably in the late 70s. I'm standing there, this is this service, by the way, that Sunday morning, some of y'all wouldn't have made it uh, halfway through it. It's four and a half hours long. <laughs> All right, I'm the last guy on the program. Of course, you knew me more than an hour early, so I'll show you how long I was there. But uh, I'm, I'm standing there, kind of, there's this, there's this wall back there, and I'm kind of leaning against the wall and uh, kind of just praying about what the Lord's going to do. It's, this guy, this pastor that I hadn't seen in a long time, comes up to me, grabs me from the time behind, gives me a big hug, and he said, oh, I heard you were going to be here, Pastor Joe. He said, I walked all the way here. Now, he lived miles and miles and miles, and he's in his mid-70s. He said, I still have that picture that we took, that I, I took of you and me. It's in my Bible. You know, and he said, now, this was one of the first trips ever. This is, you know, a decade ago. And so, to me, it just, you know, I started weeping. It just touch my heart, touch my life to see the, to see, you know, what we're doing there is, is, is making a difference in people's lives and making a difference in people's hearts and homes. So it was phenomenal. I was kind of sitting there wondering about what I was going to preach on the whole time. And uh, as the service was going on, the, uh, the, the, the president for the national conference came back and cornered me and says, you know, uh, one said, uh, what are you, you going to preach on today? I said, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> 
I said, I have two things in my heart. I'm just really praying over which one the Lord wants to do today. And, you know, I don't like that. If I'm in, in revivals and crusades, that doesn't bother me. On Sunday mornings, I'm never like that. I know exactly. Usually what I'm going to preach six months in advance. You know, but when it comes to these, you mean you got one shot, you know, it's a little different. You hear Sunday after Sunday, I'm going to hit you sometime. Amen. <laughs> You're going to get it somewhere down the road. Hold on. Today's not your day. Come back next Sunday. We'll have something special just for you. All right. Sooner or later, you're going to get it. But uh, he said, here's what I would like. He said, I would like for you just to preach today and challenge our people and preach the gospel and give an invitation. And so we did. We just got up and fired away and had a great time with the Lord and preached uh, as much as we knew how to preach and gave an invitation. Lots of people responded. So uh, thank you for being a part of what God's doing in Central America. And we're excited about what he continues to do. And uh, let's just keep it up. In June, we're going back down in there to, to Belma Pan with a crowd of, of all you that want to go and preach the gospel and hit the streets and have a crusade. And uh, there's a big soccer field. We have our aisle. We're going to be talking to them about renting that and using that for the, for, for the ministry time. But it's always an exciting time of the Lord. Last couple of Sundays, one, I was, I, I was not here. Tim always does a great job. I heard good reports. And then, uh, of course, they were all from Tim, so I don't know how that goes. But no. <laughs> You know, it's always exciting to know that if I leave town, you know, this, this pulpit's going to be covered well. You know, Pastor Strickland's uh, just, you know, Tim, again, just from the, the, the conference this weekend, you blessed my heart again. And uh, uh, thank you. You know, we, we talked about a lot, 25th anniversary. You know, Tim's been here for 20 of that. Uh, just putting up with my stuff the whole time and being so faithful. And I appreciate you, brother, and your Rebecca, your blessing, your family. But anyway, before I start, you know, I got the boohoo in mood yesterday. I'm not going to do it again. We've been out of Jude, this, this is study on apostasy, for two or three weeks now. We're going to get back to it. In fact, there's only two, two messages left in this study on apostasy, we, apostasy uh, that, that we're going to do. One is this Sunday, and the next Sunday, we'll, if the Lord allows, we'll wrap this whole thing up. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 16 today and really kind of getting into to more of the heart of what, what's going to happen in the end times. Because remember, the book of Jude is really a prophetic book as well. It's, it's talking about the last days what's going to happen in the last days and what God's going to do. It's, it's not like that prophetic book of Revelation or even Daniel where you get more specific in details. This is dealing with one aspect of, uh, of the apostates, those pretenders of the faith, those people who don't really know Jesus Christ, but they pretend to. Many of them are teachers and professors and leaders, but they're not genuine believers in Christ. They're there for their own benefit. And that's different from, you know, from... from just somebody who is wheat and tear in the church. Somebody who, who's in the church but just doesn't know, you know, doesn't know the Lord. They, they have this information in their head, but yet it hasn't been transferred to the heart. The apostate is someone who's there for their own benefit. They're, they're selfish. They're there for their own gain. They're there to get attention. Uh, if they're in leadership, they're there just to get your money. It's all about, you know, uh, shearing the sheep for the benefit of, the, of, the, of them being the shepherd. So he's dealing with those kind of peoples. Let's start in, in, in verse 12 of this passage when he said, These apostates are hidden reefs in your love feast. They feast you with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. It says, verse 13, they are wild waves of the sea, casting up their foam of their shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to, catch this, and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents. Following their own sinful desires, they are loud mouthed boasters. You know, he says, and then they're showing favoritism just to gain an advantage. Now, remember what apostasy is. It's an abandonment of truth. It's a rejection of truth. The truth of the gospel, Jesus is the only salvation. The truth of Jesus as the, uh, as the uh, triune, I mean, he's, he's God in the flesh. I mean, that he's, he's the God-man, the man-God. The truth of, uh, of, of heaven, of hell. They just pervert the scripture in whatever way is beneficial to them and to whatever their cause or their agenda might be. We've looked at five last weeks about these people. The last couple of Sundays we've talked about, kind of dealt with several things. We talked about their conduct. We dealt with their company. We talked about I mean, Israel and Balaam and Korah and all those people. And we dealt with their character, all right? Today, we're going to look at their condemnation. And we're going to look at and see what the Bible has to say. 
The, there's some very descriptive terms about these guys in verse 12. When he, and we, these were our, our sermon points last time we shared on this. We talked about that he calls them hidden rocks. They're like reefs underneath the surface of the water that you don't see that when the ship comes along, it runs ashore and wrecks the ship. He said they're like clouds, but they're clouds without water. Not like today's class, all right? They're like trees, but he calls them fruitless trees. They, they should have fruit on them. They should be bearing good fruit, but they don't bear fruit. They, there's nothing to them. He, he calls them waves, but he refers to them as raging waves, casting up filth and shame and foam. We talked about how when you, you go to the beach after a big storm surge has come in, that the, the beach is usually just filled with trash and filth and junk, you know? So he said, this is the way they are. He said, they're like wandering stars. Now, these are not the stars by which you would navigate by or find a course or steer in a direction. These are aimless wandering, just flame up, flame out, no course whatsoever, look good for a moment, and then they just die out. And he calls them, kind of wraps it up as he talks about them in those verses. He says, they are twice dead men, spiritually dead, morally dead, only interested in themselves. Now today we're going to get into that aspect I said of talking about their condemnation. He talks about their condemnation as the blackness of darkness forever. Verse 14, and it was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all of the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they've committed in such an ungodly way and all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Basically saying, hey, their time is coming. Judgment is looming. There's going to come a day. The Lord has tolerated it. He's been patient, but the end will come. And when the end comes, then it's over. Then it's done. And what he begins to get into here, and I'll share it with you as we get, if we get a little further here, is, is the judgment that awaits. And it's not just judgment for the apostates. He's dealing with judgment in general. He says God's going to come as prophesied by Enoch, and he's going to send judgment upon all, all right? So we're going to get into that in just a minute. But I, there's, there's this one part that just kind of, kind of enraptured me for a moment and got my attention as I began to study it. Because, you know, it talked about something when I started looking for a reference. And in the past, I looked for reference. There's really not a, a previous reference to. We know about Enoch because, you know, and as he starts talking about their condemnation, he talks about there was this prophecy by Enoch. Now, you know the story of Enoch. The Bible says he walked with God. But scripture makes it clear that Enoch was also a prophet. If you go back to that passage in Genesis where it talks about Enoch, it doesn't say he's a prophet there, all right? It just mentions Enoch. But later on in scripture, in the New Testament, we get a little more insight. This is, this is interesting because when you start looking at this passage and some other passages, to me, it gives real clarity to the fact that the Bible is truly inspired of God, that the Holy Spirit truly led men of old to write the scriptures because there's some things that pop out and, and that's one, but there's another that, that's, that's in scripture. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter three about the Egyptian magicians, Janus and Jambres. Remember reading that at some point in time? It says that those men, and he's making reference to back during the time of Moses and the Exodus about these Egyptian magicians. But if you go back there and study it, you don't see it there. But remember that this book, 2 Timothy and 1 Timothy and Apostle Paul, he was inspired by God to write these books. So Paul's going to write, God's going to give him some things to write that maybe we don't see back in another part of the Bible. But God gave them to him and it's, clar it's clarification of some of the things. We know that there were magicians in Egypt, right? We know that they were false leaders and teachers and false prophets and that they duplicated on some level the miracles, but God's miracle was always greater than the miracles of Moses and Aaron. So we know they were there, but Paul even makes an even more specific statement here. And he gives names to some of those guys. In Acts, Peter, uh, Paul goes on later and talks about, he's, and he makes this quote in verse 35, and he said, and remember what the Lord said, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Study the gospels. Jesus talks a lot about stewardship. He talks a lot about giving and receiving. But you don't see where Jesus uses this specific quote where the Lord said in the red letter edition of the Gospels, it's more blessed to give than to receive. But Paul said he said it. Now, let me put it this way. Remember, at the book of, when John wrote, he said there's so many things the Lord said and did. If we were to write books for all of them, the world libraries wouldn't, the world wouldn't contain that many books. But we have here another 
another illustration of the inspiration of scriptures. I believe with all my heart, and you may not, but I believe with all my heart that the word of God is inspired. I believe it is the living word of God. I believe it is infallible. I believe it is inerrant, it means it has no errors, it has no mistakes. And I believe that God, as the scripture says of itself, inspired holy men of old and gave them these words. And here are some illustrations of inspiration. Even Peter talks about Noah. And it says that he said, and I'll read you the passage later from 2 Peter, he said, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Go back into Genesis. It doesn't say Noah was a preacher there. Oh, we know he built a boat, amen. And we know that God delivered him and blessed him and he was a righteous man. But here he even said, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. We'll go back and study. It doesn't say it there, does it? But again, this again validates and shows us the inspiration of Scripture and of these men who were writing from the word of the Lord. Moses is another one. Moses was born hundreds of years after creation. All right? Long, long time after creation, Moses is born and he writes for us Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. First five books of the Bible. And in the first book of the Bible, we have a very detailed story of creation. Where do you get that? From God. In case you don't know, all right? He got it from God. God gave him and inspired him to write what was given. Even with the book of Jude here, all right? Jude, in the beginning, remember we talked about those first verses for you that were here. He says, I felt compelled to earnestly contend, to tell you to earnestly contend. What's he saying? I was motivated, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write to you about this issue of apostasy. And so in this letter and under this inspired letter uh, of, the, of the book of Jude, he talks to us about Enoch and something that Enoch said. He said that Enoch was the seventh from Adam. There was Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalal, Jared, and then Enoch. All right? They beget and they beget and they beget till they beget Enoch. All right? So Enoch's born and he speaks of Enoch and, he's, and he's, he says that Enoch prophesied. Well, we don't have that back there when it talks about Enoch. But Jude said he was a prophet. And then he prophesied about the coming of the Lord. He said, and, and Enoch said, the Lord cometh in verse 14 and 15. Now, this is the first prophecy ever given to man. In those early days of creation, five generations from Adam, seven generations from Adam, the first prophecy ever given to man about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Lots of prophecies about the first coming. Lots of prophets talked about Jesus coming, the Messiah, the Christ, the, the anointed one. And then later on in the scriptures, when we get into the major prophets and the minor prophets, we have prophecies about the second coming. Even in the beginning in Genesis, when God spoke to Adam and talked about, you know, that the seed of woman would crush the head of the serpent. That's about the first coming. But this is about the second coming of the Lord Jesus. So it's not like God got into this whole deal and kind of working the plan out as we go along. Oh, well, let's I'll send my son. Idea. Let's, let's send him twice. All right. It said, you know, that, and I'll explain this a little bit about the, the ever present, eternal present God. But the idea here is that God inspires Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, to speak this, to, to remind us of a prophecy that we don't have in the canon of scriptures, in the early scriptures, but it says that Enoch declared, the Lord cometh, and he gave this prophecy about him, and it was the first prophecy given to man. The last prophecy given to man is about the second coming of judgment, all right? So here we have this first prophecy about Enoch, and in the first prophecy, there's this prophecy about the last days and the judgment that God's going to bring. In fact, there's four things about this prophecy I want you to catch this morning that Enoch gives. He said, first of all, behold, the Lord cometh. And literally, if you look at the Greek here, it's the Lord came. The Lord, you say, what do you mean? Remember with God that he knows all things and everything in his mind and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the etern and eternity is said and done. That's why we're sitting with Christ in heavenly places today. You think that's confusing. <laughs> but basically what he's saying is that God is an eternally present God. And the past tense here that he's making of what he said, that Enoch said, he was giving a prophetic statement about the future. So when, when Enoch is giving this passage, you know, and Enoch is prophesying and Jude's recalling the prophecy, in the mind of God, it's already happened. All right. So how's that, how's that possible? The Bible tells us that God knows the beginning, that God knows the end from the beginning. Now, that's not like 
Like, like some people misread that. They say, like, well, God, God knows the end from the beginning. So God knows about the beginning and God knows about the end. No, God knew about the end before the beginning. All right. God knows everything that would take place. In fact, God set it up. It's kind of like a like the uh, if you ever took a music box apart and it's got that little cylinder in it. It's got the little pegs on it. And as the pegs go around, it ding, 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 makes the music. Time is like this cylinder that God's already set the pegs on. All right. So it's already set. So Enoch can say the Lord came as he's looking back. John, when he's in the book of Revelation, he's seeing everything that's happened, right? So basically with John and he's talking about the judgments and he's talking about the tribulation and he's talking about, you know, the, the heaven and he's talking about the wedding, all those things. They've already happened as John's seen them. He's just watched them just go by and he's given a record. Enoch is hearing what the Lord said and in the mind of God, it's already happened. For us, it's still on the peg to come around to hit the right note. If you're still with me, kind of say, uh huh. All right. The idea is that it's already happened. You know, something's going to happen. In other words, because God's already determined it would happen and it's not going to be changed. So we can say it in the past tense because nothing's going to change this. It's going to happen. Sometimes past tense means the future, especially in regards to prophecy, because God's the eternal God and God lives in the eternal present. To give you an idea of this. God. Uh, created Adam and Eve. God knew that Adam and Eve would sin, did he not? Or did that take him by surprise? It didn't take him by surprise because he knows the end. From the very beginning, he knows what's happening. All right? He knows what's going to happen. That's why the Bible tells us in the book, the Revelation, the last book, that, the, that God provided for our salvation before we ever needed salvation. All right, that, that it says that, that Jesus was crucified, that the lamb was crucified from before the foundations of the earth. So in the mind of God, knowing that Adam would sin, God's plan, the cylinder is pegged up just right. God's going to send an answer for man's sin long before man ever sinned. That's, that's one of the blessings I know that God's going to meet my needs because he, he already knows every need I'll ever have. And he said, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches. Amen. In glory. In other words, everything's already provided for now, we'll talk about that another time. But the idea, he said, behold, the Lord cometh. Now, this next part is, is a blessing because as he sees this prophecy unfold before him, he says, the Lord is coming with his holy myriads. I believe the way the King James, the King James Bible puts it. Who is this crowd that the, that the Lord is coming with? Deuteronomy gives a little insight when he says, and he said, the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them, and he shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of his saints. From his right hand went a law before him. Now this is talking about when Moses goes up on Sinai and gets this covenant relationship uh, uh, with God renewed, that, that, that the God's going to deliver his people, establish the law, all that's going on. But the Lord shows up not by himself. He, the triune God shows up there along with all the holy ones. And I believe the holy ones here are all those people who died up to that point, up to the time of Moses and have been in heaven waiting for their glorified resurrection of bodies. All right, they're there. And all the, the angels as well. So when he's talking about 10,000s of his saints, those are all the people who died before us and gone on. Zechariah puts it this way when he talks about, and you shall flee the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach into Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye have fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. He's prophesying about this appearance of God with all the people of God, all the angels of God. I believe this is not just the created angels. This is all God's people who put their faith, their trust in him. Matthew, Jesus is prophesying and giving a little insight when he's talking about his second coming. He says, when, when I come, the son of man shall come in his glory, all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. There's coming a day, he says, when I'm going to show up and I'm bringing all the angels. We know from scriptures and other verses of scripture is not just the angels, it's a myriad, a congregation of cherubim and seraphim and people who've given their life to the Lord Jesus Christ and set with God in glory. Colossians 3, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you shall also appear with him in glory. I believe when Paul is talking to the church about the mystery that wasn't quite understood until that time, when he said, you know, there's coming that day when the dead in Christ are going to rise, the trump of the Lord's going to sign, and every person you've ever known who's trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, husbands, brothers, fathers, sons, and sisters, they're going to come with the Lord. And on that great day of resurrection, their bodies are going to come up out of the grave glorified. 
transformed, transfigured, glorified, and they're going to be rejoined to their bodies. And the Bible says, then we who remain, those who didn't go up in the grave group, all right, we, then we shall be caught up to be with the Lord forever. So there's going to be this great resurrection and this great gathering of God's people. We're going to go into that place called heaven. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, on planet Earth, all hell's going to break loose. And at the end of that judgment, that seven years of judgment upon the earth, then we're going to come back with the Lord with him. Second Thessalonians says that we're going to come with him. But when we come, what are we going to do? We're going to come as the prophet of Enoch, or the prophecy of Enoch was, to execute judgment on all. Now, in, in the Greek language, as you're breaking down the language, what's called an infinitive of purpose. In other words, you have this sentence and something's going to happen. And this, this is a declaration of purpose here. This is what's going to take place, that when the Lord comes with his holy ones, with his angels, with his people, with the saints of God, then they're coming for a purpose that all will be judged. All right. Now, Jesus has already come. For those people who are getting a little upset, this morning, you're talking about judgment. And you know it. Hey, chill out. You don't have to face judgment. All right? Jesus came and was judged for you already. The Bible says all your sin was laid upon Jesus Christ. I don't have to account for my sin anymore. Why? Because Jesus accounted for it for me. My sin has been dealt with my sin has been paid for. The wages of sin is death. So someone died in my place, took my payment, my judgment upon them. Jesus said, he who believeth on me is not condemned or judged, but he that believeth not is already under judgment. All right. So everybody that's not under Jesus, everybody that's not claimed Christ, and specifically these apostates in context, are going to experience this judgment when the Lord comes with his people to execute judgment upon all. He's come. Now, 2 Thessalonians writes it this way. To give you who are troubled rest with us, that when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with an everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And that's big, strong words. And I know that, let me tell you, I know that those are words that the world we live in and the culture we live in does not want to hear those words. He goes on to say in this passage, and when Jesus comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because of our testimony among you was believed. Therefore, we always pray for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. He said, listen, there's coming this day when judgment's gonna come. And for those of you who believe, it's not gonna be a harsh thing. It's something you're looking for. You wanna see this day of judgment because you're gonna see Jesus in all his glory and you're gonna be manifest in all your glory with Jesus on that day. So he's gonna come in judgment, praise the Lord. And when he comes in judgment, the fourth thing about this probably he tells us what is going to be the outcome. Let me go ahead and pass that. What is going to be the outcome or the result of his coming? He says when he comes, he's going to judge all those. And basically, he kind of, the wording here is to bring tremendous conviction. In other words, when Jesus shows up, people are going to see just how sinful they were. It's like the lights are going to come on. You know, and the lights come on, everything's going to be seen. How many of you, when you got up this morning and got ready for church, turned the lights on in the bathroom to get ready? Some of you were frightened. <laughs> I usually am. All right. You saw yourself and you started washing and showering and combing and spraying and pasting and painting or whatever else might be a part of the process. All right. So by the time you walked out of there, due to the wonderful miracle of light, you were fixed up. Amen. Amen. But there's a lot of people today who think they're fixed up that aren't. You know? 
And when the lights come on, everybody's going to see themselves for what they really are. Not what they've pretended, what, not what they've professed, not what they've excused themselves, not how they've judged. The lights are going to come on when Jesus comes. And he said, I'm going to convict them. And it's like this tremendous conviction of deeds. And the conviction comes not only with a, an exposure of we're wrong, but with, an ex, with, with a conviction of you're wrong and guilty. You're wrong, you're responsible. You made choices. You made decisions. You can't blame mom at that day. You can't blame daddy. You can't blame the preacher. You can't blame your culture. You can't blame divorce. You can't blame nothing. We're just going to be exposed for our own decisions, our own choices, and especially as apostates. And he said, I'll convince them of all their, you know, the, all, all their ungodly deeds and their ungodly actions. In fact, he uses the word four times, and they talk about their ungodly character, their ungodly actions, their ungodly attitudes, and their ungodly words. They talk about their hard speeches. They're just guilty on so many different accounts. And then in, in those following verses that we read a while ago, he starts reflecting upon their behavior as he talks about how ungodly they are. The next verse is their, 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 their murmurs. Their, their murmurs. He said, no, they're murmurs, they're complainers. Remember we talked about Cain and Balaam and Korb and how they complained and rejected God's authority and complained about the way God wanted to do things and how God instituted leadership. They didn't want anything to do with it. They wanted their own way. He said, they're self-seeking. In other words, their life is not about the glory of God. Their life is not about others. Their life is about themselves. He said, he said they speak swelling words. What is that? You know, in other words, they creep into churches and they creep into seminaries and they creep into Bible colleges. These kind of people are talking about that try to infect Christianity, to draw people away from the truth and to draw them where? To draw them to themselves. Look how smart I am. I'll stop when I'm ready. That's for all you that never turn your phones off. It might be an alarm, but you better pay attention. <laughs> Self-seeking, they don't care about others. He said they speak swelling words. They, they creep in and with great words and great speeches and soft and fair words. How many times do you see that? The word is eulogia in the Greek language, all right? In other words, y'all know what a eulogy is. That's where this word, Greek word, you know, we, our English word comes from that word eulogia. You know, a eulogy is when they get up and say all those things about you that aren't necessarily true, uh, you know, while you were alive. Speak well is what it means up. He said, the apostate preachers and the apostate teachers will build you up just to build you up for yourself's sake so that they can get your attention and be able to get something from you they want. It's all about what they can get from you. And so they use vain speech, feigned words, Peter said, empty words, good words. You're so wonderful. You're the best. You know, they, you, you. they won't talk about your failures. They won't talk about sin. They won't talk about judgment. And they certainly won't talk about what we're talking today. You're not going to hear these kind of sermons in those kind of situations because it's, it, they don't want to do anything that might run somebody off or offend somebody or affect the love offering in, in any way. It says they're partial, they're respecters of men. You know, they, they, just, uh, they just agree with you to get favor with you. They won't tell you the truth. They won't be honest with you. They just tell you what you wanted, to, what they think you want to hear. And then... So the apostate's a person who just tells people what they, what they desire. And he says they're greedy. That's the bottom line. What can they get from you? Now, what he's saying here is that they should expect, this is Enoch's prophecy. This is what Jude's trying to say on several occasions. What they should expect is the worst punishment. They should expect the worst. Second Peter says, through covetousness, they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you. Their judgment lie a long time lingers not. In other words, it says, don't think that God's going to sleep on this day or judgment's going to, it's not. Damnation is not sleeping. It's, it's, it's like the peg on the wheel. It's coming around. Judgment's coming. Whose judgment lingers? In fact, you'll never hear the apostate preacher preach this. Yeah. He'll never talk about judgment. You know, you, you, uh, you just wonder, whatever happened to hell in the church? You know, whatever happened to hell? We just, we, hell's forgotten doctrine. Uh, the first service this morning, a lady came to me as a visitor. She said, you know how many years, she said, I can't even remember how many years it was since uh, that I've heard a sermon about hell or judgment. Hey, if we truly care about people, if we truly love people, if we're truly concerned about people's eternal souls, how can we not talk about this? How can we not share about these things and say, hey, listen, you, God's provided grace and mercy. You don't have to experience this. You can experience life. But you know, the apostate, he's not going to deal with those things. So he reminds them of the reality of hell, 
which needs to be done and needs to be rehearsed today. We need to get back to reminding. In fact, Jesus taught more about hell than anybody in the Bible. Now, that may be hard for some people to believe because what I hear sometimes people say, oh, we just need to be like Jesus. <laughs> just tell everybody about love. Well, yeah, Jesus was the epitome, the personification of love. But because he loves so dearly, he talked about this subject more than any other prophet, preacher, teacher, spiritual guide, or leader in all the Bible. More verses on hell can be attributed to Jesus than anybody. Now, if Jesus gave so much attention to it, don't you think we ought to give so much attention to it? Jesus is telling the parable, remember the rich man, that he died and went to hell, clothed in purple, fine linen, fared some every day, and what happens? He died. And he went to hell. He's in hell, this rich man is, and he's begging for a drop of water. But there's no satisfaction. No drop of water is given. And then he's pleading, somebody go warn my family that they would not come to this awful place. So Jesus is giving clarity that there's hell that's coming. In fact, Jesus taught that hell was real. Matthew 5, he said, I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And he's talking here about the whole idea of you calling people fools, and, you know, you're realizing, hey, don't stand over judgment and other people. There's only one judge. It's Jesus. But you do need to tell people that if their ways are not changed and God has set this out already. It's not that I'm judging anybody when I talk about judgment. I'm saying this is what God has prepared. And this is what's going to happen. Jesus said they can be in danger of. In other words, he's saying hell's real. Hell's real. That was the words of Jesus. Jesus said he's talking about having making radical decisions about things in your life that are hindering you. We're being talked about plucking your eye out and cutting your hand off. It wasn't that, you know, you had to go out here and cut your eye, pluck, pluck your eye out and cut your hand off. He was saying, make, make radical decisions. Do what needs to be done to get your heart and your life right with God. De renounce the things that will cause problems in your life. Turn to Jesus completely and fully. He said, because, hey, there is a hell. There is a hell. There needs to be genuine repentance in your life to turn to Christ because hell's real. Matthew 7, he talked about, back that up for me one one. One, one page there. In Matthew chapter 7, he talked about the reality of hell. One more under it. See if it'll go to it. He said that every tree that brings forth, not forth good fruit. Well, I guess it wants to stay there. Every tree that brings forth not good fruit, you know, is going to be cast into the fire. Talking about hell. Now, Jesus also said, tells us a little bit about hell and that it is darkness. And even Jews use that word, the blackness of darkness forever. In Matthew 8, he said, the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. Weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. Matthew 10, he talks about, don't fear them which kill the body, not able to kill the soul. Rather him which able to, fear him who's able to destroy both the soul and the body in what? In hell. Is Jesus making this up? And I, some people say, well, you know, I, I believe in Jesus and I believe in all that stuff, Jesus, but I, you know, I just don't believe this stuff about hell. You can't dissect that. <clears throat> Because if you try to dissect what Jesus taught about hell and everything else Jesus taught, then you're basically saying Jesus was just a good guy, but he had a tendency to lie about some stuff. Yeah. Or he was deluded. I do not think the Son of God is deluded. Amen. He is the eternal light, the eternal life, the eternal word. So you can't separate that. If Jesus preached about hell, then we need to pay attention. Hell is a reality and hell is darkness. In Matthew 13, he made this statement. when he says, therefore, the, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it shall be so in the end of the world. What are tares? Tares are pretend Christians. Remember, we preached on the, the parable of the sower who went out and sowed the wheat and that weeds came up, you know, beside it. And he said that the tares is people who look like the real thing, but they're not the real thing. There's a lot of people in churches today. You know, there's, there's the Christian field out there, and here's all the wheat that's growing up. But amongst the wheat, Jesus said, the enemy will come in and sow weeds among the wheat. And he said, you know, but not to worry about it. He said, judgment will reveal who it is, and at the end times, I'll take care of it. And he says, hey, that will be cast into hell, the darkness of hell. Jesus said, hell's eternal. He said in Mark 9, 43, if you're at right hand, defend you. It's that same verse from Matthew, but he went on to say here, that into the fire that shall never be quenched. No end to this fire. It's an eternal. They go away into everlasting punishment. What's everlasting? Eternal. Hell will be forever and ever and ever. Mark 9 says, it is where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. In other words, the maggots don't die there. You won't die there. Everything's forever there. And everything is forever 
dark there. And everything is forever separated from everything that is holy. Jesus spoke about hell being an exclusion, a separation. He said, I'm gonna, they're going to stand before me that day and I will say unto them that are on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. See, hell was not originally meant for you. Hell was meant for the rebellious angelic forces and Satan. That hell was prepared for them. But if you refuse to receive, you know, the life jacket, the, the, the lifeline, the salvation, the deliverance and the hope that Christ offers to the cross, then you have no hope. You're going for it to a place that was prepared for somebody else because you wouldn't take the place that God had prepared for you. You reject it. I just, don't people, God, I just can't see God sending anybody to hell. God's given you every opportunity. God's given you his word. God gave you the prophets. God gave, sends the Holy Spirit. God sent his son Jesus to die for you. The Holy Spirit convicts you and convinces you to turn. But people love their sin more than they love God. They love themselves more than they love Christ. And so they choose hell. Willingly choose hell over heaven. And it's eternal and it's exclusive. It is ultimate separation. Jesus said that hell is torment. He said the king of the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away in the outer darkness and there shall be weeping, gnashing of teeth. Hell's not a fun place. I, I've heard people often say, oh, you know, I'm just going to die and go to hell with all my friends. We'll just get around getting drunk all the time. Not going to be any bars in hell. Sorry to tell you, not going to be any booze in hell. There's not going to be anything to anesthetize the pain. In fact, I don't believe you're going to be anywhere but in hell by yourself. All you will hear is the wailing and the weeping and the gnashing of teeth, but there'll be no fellowship. It's isolation. It is torment. It's hell is what it is. And Jesus spoke about it. In fact, Jesus talked about it in regard like hell, almost having greater degrees or greater levels of hell. I say unto you, should be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the dead judgment. He said, it's for the crowd he's talking to, for you. And you, Capernaum, you're exalted into heaven. You're going to be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works had been done in you that had been done in Sodom, it would remain until this day. But I say to you, it should be more tolerable for the land of Sodom, the dead judgment there for thee. God said, I judge Sodom. But Sodom probably would have repented if they'd heard and seen what you've heard and seen. But you've seen me and you've heard me and you've rejected me. Therefore, it's going to be more tolerable for the Sodomites and the Gomorrahites than it's going to be for you. Wow. I believe that Madeleine Murray O'Hara and the Hitlers and those of our culture and generation who've murdered and despised God and rejected the authority of God and all those wicked people of Stalin and Lenin and those guys who killed millions of Christians. Hell is going to be bigger and broader and more horrible for them than others. And for the apostates especially. God says this in 2 Peter, if he didn't spare the angels who sinned and cast them down to hell, I delivered those angels into chains and darkness to be reserved for judgment. I didn't spare the ancient world, but I saved Noah and the eight righteous people. I saved Noah, that preacher of righteousness. I brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. I turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. I condemned them to destruction. I made an example of them to those who afterwards would live ungodly lives. I delivered righteous lot out of that judgment of the wicked. Second Peter 2, he says, listen, these like natural brute beasts, these apostates, they speak evil things they don't understand. They're going to perish in their own corruptions. They will receive the wages of unrighteousness. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 17, these are wells without water, clouds carried by tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Second Peter 2, 21, it would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than having known it, turn from that holy commandment that was delivered to them. In other words, they knew but they rejected. They had the opportunity, they had the information, but they rejected the transforming power of Jesus Christ. They had a form of godliness, but they denied the power of it. Hell's real, folks. It's not the most popular subject in the world, and it probably isn't going to be preached today in 99% of the churches in America. But it's still real. And the greatest thing that any of us can do is to do what the Apostle Peter did tell us when, before he wrote those words. He says, make your calling and election sure, brethren. Make sure that you know Jesus Christ because if you're just a pretend believer, and some people are very good at pretend believers. 
You, they many times are the last person you would ever expect. He said, you better make sure you know Jesus Christ because hell's not worth it. I never forget in Alice, Texas, I was doing a revival back in the 80s. Gave the invitation, a little lady came up, prayed to receive Jesus. I didn't know who she was and sat down in the front row and, and uh, several of the people came forward and got saved. And a lot of people were getting right with God. When it was all over, the pastor was introducing the people who had given their life to Christ. This little precious lady, probably in her early 80s. She said, can I say something? The pastor said, oh, sure. And I'm sitting here just listening to the whole thing. She said, probably everybody in this church knows me. I've been here as long as this church has been here. I've taught most of you in Sunday school. I've headed up the Women's Missionary Union. I'm here every Sunday. She said, but all of these years that you have known me, I have wrestled over this issue. I have never really given my heart to Jesus Christ. She said, I have been a pretender in your midst, and I can't do this anymore. I need to give my life to Jesus Christ today. But you know, there's a lot of people like that. Their pride keeps them away from being saved. Their pride. In fact, you know what Isaiah said? He said, hell hath enlarged its jaws because of the proud hearts of men. Hell's having to go through an enlargement process because people are too proud to admit, I've been putting on a show. It's been external. Oh, I've wanted to, but I haven't. Because I'm afraid of what people might say or think or do. I, I can't, I can't play this game anymore. I heard the campus this morning. A guy's been coming to church over a year and a half. Everybody thinks he's a devout guy. He walked up to me. He says, that's my description there. I can't do this anymore. I, I got to give my heart to Jesus. I know what I need to do. I've never really taken this seriously in my life. Oh, I've gone to God and prayed prayers and cried and all that good stuff, but I've never given my life to him. He said, I'm not, gonna, I'm not leaving this place today unless, unless this is straight. Amen. And he prayed and gave his life to Jesus this morning. How many like that there this morning? I love you enough to tell you these things. This church loves you enough to stand on the truth of God's words and proclaim these things. We stand together for you. And it doesn't matter if you've been a charter member of this fellowship. It doesn't matter, you know, if, if, if your family is one of the leading families. If you don't know Jesus, it is not worth the price to play the game. Right. And some point and some time in your life, I don't know when, it's going to be too late. But if you're hearing him speak to your heart today, it's not too late right now. The grace of God is available. Jesus died. Listen to me. Jesus died for you. He did what? He died. Severe, painful, slow. Hours he hung on that cross. Agony. We have people who don't want anybody to know they've given their life to Jesus. Well, I, know, I know what I need to do, but, you know, but... The, Listen, we're going to give an invitation in just a moment. If you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you come. It doesn't matter who you are. I was in Lumberton, Texas, doing a revival one Sunday morning. Called the musicians to come forward and the worship leader to come forward. Worship leaders sent the band up to start the worship service. He came down, took me and said, I can't go up there. I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm who you're talking about. I need to give my life to Jesus. I, I've been leading worship for years in this church. He said, but... If I examine my heart today, there's never really been a time I got serious with God. I've been religious. I've sought to be moral, to be a good provider for my family, to be a good man. He said, but I see that's a waste of time. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Jesus is the only one who paid the price. You can't get to heaven without Jesus. You can't be a Christian without Jesus. You can be a Baptist. You can be a Methodist. You can be a Catholic. You can be lots of things, but you can't be a believer without Christ in your life. What would it take for you today to give your heart to Jesus Christ? And what a great day. In God's house with God's people. Spirit's present. The word of God's open. People will stand with you, rejoice with you. But you have a decision to make. Would you stand with your heads bowed? I would say to every believer in this room.